Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee and or occasionally wine or other things and talking about anything and everything mostly related to writing. We may use explicit language and will almost certainly drop F-bombs, but this is not the point or drive of the content, so consider us PG-13. There will be rants and raves and occasional readings. There will be conflicting creative advice driven by at least three utterly disparate points of view. Your hosts through this adventure are Jeannie Warner, guest host and web spider David Welsh, and me, John Schmidt. This is episode five, More Writing Careers. I'm handing it back to Jeannie. The adorable Chaz is busily prepping for his half-birthday party coming up shortly, Uh, which he, of course, celebrates, the half-birthday being even more important than the full birthday. And given that our sound engineer is also a writer, we've drafted Dave into the studio today. Say hi to the family, Dave. Hi to the family, Dave. Opening up, to begin, to the day, we're going to start with a reading. Uh, There's a poem that was written by our friend Liz Houchin behind the Redwood Curtain. Now, if you remember a couple episodes ago, John performed an extemporaneous poem about her, and she responded gloriously by writing a poem back. And let this be a lesson to all of you that you should totally write to us. John, please read Liz's poem. I am going to expand on your comment first. If you send us a poem, I may or may not respond with a poem. But if you send us a question, I will certainly have a rant on it. Which may be, I don't know, but is more likely, I know. So, Liz's poem is not in direct reference to my poem, but I really liked it. And I think you should hear it. Hard lines. Hard lines of sun and soil have chiseled rewards around your brow, your laughter and tears etched like the fields plowed and planted, each seed, each season, a harvest of emotions. I notice them and shamefully quiet my jealousy, for a woman who shares them Does she see your intense pools of blue swallowing me? She wears the same hard lines, unsmiling, and without the fertility of your soul. Has she suffered longer? Lean muscles beneath your t-shirt, calloused hands, working hands, car hearts bunching and pulling in, places unexamined, unrevealed. Believe me. I've examined you plenty. Sweat traverses each groove, calling my tongue to follow, to taste, to remove your clothes and appreciate the bounty of your fields, to cross hard lines. Ooh, totally steamy there, Liz. Thank you. I get the feeling that wasn't entirely about agriculture. I'm sure you're incorrect. I mean, there was once upon a time that a man plowed his wife and fucked his fields. So this was just historical, beautifully historical. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Liz, for that poem. And uh, to the listeners, you may want to imagine that in a female voice, or maybe not. (laughs) I I say you, you, I'm not telling them what to imagine. So what are you going to tell them? Uh, I'm going to tell him that, you know, we've tried to encourage before people to say you're a writer, although you may not realize you're a writer, or you think to yourself, I just scrubble things in the lines of my notebook at work. We wanted to talk about other ways that writing is a career. And frankly, writing begets more writing. The more you write, the better you get at writing. And one of the ways we're going to talk tonight is how Dave came to it. So this kind of could be for the kids at home or anybody who wants to write more and might not consider what they do, air quotes, writing. Dave, Dave is a tech writer. Tell us about tech writing, Dave. Well, um, I have to preface this by saying that you've mostly been talking about creative writing up till now, and I've been doing creative writing since I was a kid. Um, And I don't consider tech writing to be the same sort of thing. I I don't know. I kind of... I'm going to disagree with you, but I'll hold it. Tell me why you think it isn't. Um, Well, uh, tech writing doesn't involve you creating ideas. It's you dictating other people's ideas, essentially, uh, most of the time. uh, The the gist of the job is 
um, you need to write some sort of technical documentation. Let's just say a, a manual for some software, since I mostly work in software. Um, so you go to the engineers, the, the programmers who wrote it, and ask how it works. And uh, you play with the software, and you write down instructions for how to do things in it. And uh, um, it turns out that's not a terribly creative endeavor, at least not in my experience. I, I could see that. But, John, you were, we were talking about ABCs. John, tell them about the ABCs of writing. There are a huge number of mnemonics, and this actually is stolen from an excellent writer, of course, uh, Louis McMaster Bujold, uh, from her Verkosigan series. ABC, going backwards, clarity, brevity, accuracy. And going backwards so you'll think about it. And the craft of writing, depending on what you're writing, is not separate from the subject of writing and that's a point worth arguing, but you always want to write towards your goal. And if you're writing something for someone else to understand, and my particular thing that I write a fair amount of is curricula, of course, being the, the plural of curriculum, study plans and lessons, occasional PowerPoints, accuracy, brevity, and clarity. It's got to be right. It's got to be relatively short, although that's a style thing. Of course, a hundred years ago, you would make it longer because they paid you by the word. And it's got to be clear. Dickens makes so much more sense now when you think that somebody got paid by the word. And Twain as well. Mm. In tech writing, you don't get paid by the word. Um, accuracy is of those three is far and away the most important. Um, but clarity comes in a close second, and brevity is... Um, the soul of wit. It, it's out, out the window. I don't know. See, I, I was forced to sit and read something the other day that was a rule book for a game. And while it had a lot of words, which I think were all very accurate, um, it lacked that clarity of things saying, I'm going to give you an idea. I mean, for instance, most modern role playing now, to look at your standard RPGs, I have two theories of what sells an RPG. It's the art and it's the story. Uh, White Wolf out there was one of the first ones to figure this out when they're saying, oh, we're going to have kind of sexy art because it came out about the same time as a, a thing called nightlife. And I loved nightlife. I loved the elegant, simple, mana-driven theory of how the world works and the universe works. And it was superior and more playable and required less figuring out, less fewer house rules, um, a lot of those details. But the art was crap and it didn't tell you a story. Mm. So yeah, the first the first version of cyberpunk. This is a counter example. Right? The first version of um, cyberpunk that came out was very rough, poorly edited, and had crap art. But it was in the right time at the right place, and it sold like gangbusters, at least yeah. in my crowd. And they got better. They did get better with <laughs> the second had, edition. Yes, and the production books. values got better. Yeah. So beyond technical writing, you've just highlighted a very difficult field, but one that is in its own ways expanded. I know a number of writers in this field. And that is gaming, RPGs, yeah. game rules. Uh, now we're seeing a lot more live stream situations of gaming. And uh, you can go from fanfic. You talked about going from muds and mushes into real writing. You can go from fanfic the same way. So there is, that's a way to practice your craft. Well, it, and, it, look at even the game that everybody, you know, we're all playing the Wizards Unite right now. Like we are the biggest geeks that ever lived. So passing our little numbers back and forth, and there's little story, those little storylets that go with, hey, reached an advancement, you've ground your way past a first certain number of confundables, and you know, here's your thing. It may not seem like it, but that's still a story, and it's certainly brevity. <laughs> and it's certainly writing. To listeners who um, don't play this game yet, um, I don't either. I've resisted so far, so <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. Solidarity, brothers and yeah. sisters. Um. Uh, for the sake of completeness, um, I do want to say one other thing about technical writing, since you kind of brought it up, which is, um, yes, it, in some ways it is a, a, a place to practice style, or I mean, you are, you are working with words, so even though it's not creative and, to me, fun for that reason, um, it's a, a way to, you have to think about how you say things. Yeah. Um, and, and I do that um, more than I had have to at work. Um, it's you can go away with writing some pretty sloppy uh, things as long as it 
Uh, you've all read bad documentation. It gets out there somehow. Um, it's it's the same as, as any other production writing. It's um, constrained by time and schedules. Um, and again, the only thing that, or the far and away, the, the most important thing they think about is, is it accurate? I I have to admit, there's a there are a couple authors that I follow, and I read all of the books that they write. Every now and again, even my favorite author seems to have a, wow, that deadline must have jumped up at them in a big hurry because this mm -hmm. this just doesn't make the sense of all the others. It doesn't have the elegance, or that didn't really go through their writers group, or mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Maybe mm -hmm. it's we can't all be gems, but some of them, there are those that are consistent and clear through everything, like gosh, I love Ursula Vernon. And then there's some that are consistent don't. and clear and then suddenly not for one book and then they get it all back together again. So I don't give up because of the one, but it's the same general idea of the same clarity. Um, Dave got me hooked on, or I don't remember which of us got us hooked on, Jonathan Cabal's Necromancer series. Johannes Cabal. Johannes Cabal Necromancer. Yeah. And he started with, I, I looked at the history of what he was before he started writing books. He wrote games. Uh -huh. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. He was a gamer. And uh, Dave here also used to run a lot of us through um, Ars Magica, the one true greatest magic system that ever lived. Uh -huh. and <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to argue about that on the, No, no. Sure we well, can. we will, but... Not we, on the podcast. But, but, maybe a different podcast. But the beauty of it was, is you read it and you understood it. And it was... You need a verb and you need a noun. <laughs> You're going to verb them. I verb you. I, no. I verb noun you. Mm -hmm. I verb your noun. Of course, it was in Latin. so you know. Everything is more pretentious in Latin. It's beautiful. Uh -huh. So I think all of these can be gaming writing. So I, I count that it's all one. I think Jonathan Howard learned to tell a story. Maybe it was just through those... I have to get this to one sentence. I have to get this to one small set of dialogue. Mm -hmm. I have to get this to what is going to appear on the screen. Mm -hmm. I have, maybe Twitter has actually helped us in the long run when we all had to say, I have to keep this under 300 characters. I do know a writer who makes his living as in part a professional writer and scholar who was publishing poetry on Twitter. And so I took it as a challenge for a brief period to write poems in the, at that time, 140 character limit. Mm -hmm. Although there's also a real fun in writing poems in a an epic bardic way where each chapter of the poem is a tweet. But you can fall down that rabbit hole really deep and not get very far. Did you guys read the book, The Deepest State? It started out being written on Twitter? No. Tell us more. Oh, um, <laughs> I, I will bring it and read a little bit from it next time. But it's Twitter length, each statement. And it is, um, we'll call it political satire in the manner of the onion. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is it's a little beautiful. And I got teary and couldn't stop laughing as I was reading it. So mm -hmm. kudos to you. And I'll, I'll find a link to it and put them up on the notes for today. But you can tell a story a little lump at a time. Yep. So rolling back to other professions related to writing, because the, the distinction of a, telling a story, I believe that a narrative is at the heart of every good art. Every good art tells a story, and I uh, recently had a choreographer who did a non-storytelling telling piece tell me that she believed that too, but again, another discussion. I have recently talked to a grant writer who found that the strictures of grant writing informed her creative writing because she rebelled against the very precise strictures of the grant writing and used flowery, flowery and florid prose onomatopoeia, wordplay, not quite up to Umberto Eco's paragraph of all beginning with the letter P in the name of the rose, but still. And she makes her living writing grants. And discussion with her led me to remember that I have several friends, uh, including one I'm hoping to get on the show, who write plays. Yeah, and, ooh, screenplays. Uh, screenplays and regular plays. One of them is actually... When she's not touring with her plays, and she's heading to France right now, Carol Wolf teaches writing. And so she makes her money for supporting her writing, besides being successful, by teaching writing. And she note, told me that at one point, offhandedly, that I was in the wrong profession. Because I like to teach science, and you really need to be pretty much hands-on for science. you got to break the glassware if you're in chemistry. And she can teach writing over the internet easily. 
Mm. But she's very good at it, and I'm hoping to see her play uh, A Thousand Nights. I'll have to look it up when it comes to San Francisco. Anyway, uh, so there are other professions out there, there and we're, we've only scratched a surface. I'm sure there's a thousand more. Oh, yeah. I can I can use... I was thinking of two examples that I had of other ways that, that writing matter. One was... Um, I worked in a security operations center on the date that I happened to be at work is September 12th, 2001. One of the people that we were monitoring the infrastructure network for was uh, the Department of IT for New York City. So shortly after we all watched um, the dreadful events that happened that day, I was called upon by the uh, director of IT called me up and said, okay, I am going into the mayor's office to read something about how your company is monitoring and keeping us secure, I kind of need it in the next 15 minutes. So I, I got to read a, a real brief of what are we doing? How are we doing? How do I sum it up to make it long enough to have a certain gravitas, be clear enough that nobody's going to read it and say, but what about this? What about this? Yeah. And it was, it was a little bit of an adventure, and I lost a, I think I sweated a bucket. Yeah. <laughs> but. So I'm surprised nobody's brought it up yet since we're talking about brevity and clarity, but uh, he said, um, it was uh, Blaise Pascal originally, I think he said uh, I, something to the effect of, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry this is so long, I would have made it shorter, but I didn't have time. Oh, God, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I find that to be very true, actually, and part of the reason that... <laughs> um, oh, I, I've hit the end of stories and done a word search on the word very Mm -hmm. I've gone back and erased every single one of them, and, and I've mm -hmm. never managed to make it through without at least 10 erasing. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. The exact quote is, I have made this letter longer than usual because I lack the time to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. Is that the Pascal version? That is it's the, been used without attribution since he said it throughout yeah. history. Uh, that is a, one of the translations of Blaise Pascal. Okay. So there, the, there are other translations as well. Yeah. It's true, and, and editing is much much longer topic that we will, uh, I think we should probably devote some time to it coming yeah. up. But Well, I'm horrible at it, so yes, definitely, please. But yes, how do you get to a point where you say, I know where I want to go with this, and then how do I turn it back, and how do I, how do I get to the point? But, yeah. but the clarity in writing, I want to say that, you know, for any kid that sits there and can't spell, I actually don't care if you can spell, because the glory of the modern writing tools that are out there. You yeah. ought to learn to spell because it's good and it'll save you a hurry, but the clarity of thought and how do you get it out there and how do you put it in place and make it understanding, look at marketing. Look I was going to say, <laughs> you, uh, you have a perfect example of a job that requires a lot of writing and uh, is not technically a writing job. See how I did that? See what I did there? Not technically a writing job. Although, I don't know, maybe it is. Tell us about marketing writing. Um, marketing writing has been kind of interesting. It's taken a, a couple turns through the years. There was an enormous breakthrough. If you remember the Apple commercial, the 1984, 1984. Apple commercial, where they were all, no. and they gave you imagery. And the guy ran up there in the runner, mm -hmm. and he took the chair, and he hurled it through the screen. Yes. And did that talk about... Apple computers? Did it talk about chips? Did it talk about circuits? Did anything electronic involved in that except for that there was a screen playing? No. no. It made you feel something. It made you think about something. It's and marketing if it makes you feel storytelling something. Storytelling changed. I, I want to, there no was marketing another. marketing changed and involved. Well, it, it does. I mean, so look, at, it used to be the jingle. I mean, yeah. everybody here can sit and sing you the jingle for the Big Mac. I used Special to orders backwards. not upset us, no. No, no, no that's, that's hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. That's no, I'm talking, right? Two yes. whole beef patty special sauce, lettuce, you know, right. so when don't sue, I'm sorry, don't sue me. <laughs> and when you're threatened by a stranger, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, but but that was the thing, is they were jingles because they wanted the mnemonic to stick in your head. They wanted right. you to, they wanted your kids to sing, we all scream for ice cream and go to the Tasty Freeze. Mm -hmm. But Nike took it to the next level too. Swoosh. Did you see the woman run, running up the mountain road? And she's running up a road. And mm -hmm. she and the, the narrative says, this is me time. Mm -hmm. This is time that I have to set aside for myself, that I'm not taking 
kids to camps. I'm not cleaning the house. I'm not doing my job. Mm. This is purely a moment that I am taking for myself. And the end says, just do it. It's interesting that you bring up all these examples that use so very few words. I, They actually don't. <laughs> but the right words. And she is illustrating a sea change in marketing from her point of view, mm -hmm. that it went from the 1950s. Actually, if you ever go down to haberdashers, they've papered the bathrooms with 1930s ads, which is small picture wall of text. Yeah. Small picture wall of text, and it evokes the feelings with a wall of text. And you're right. There's still a strong narrative there, and someone wrote that narrative. So I'm actually siding away from the technical writer towards the marketing writer in that there's a lot of writing and marketing. Your writing does not always have to be expressed directly in words. It's true. Like if we were going to do a screenplay, we could be waiting for Genie, and a lot of the screenplay might be, okay, look stage left and frown, although usually not because that's the director's purview. So, well, are we talking about writing at this point? I mean, of course, something like a commercial has to have a script and storyboards and that sort of thing. I mean, if there's only three words in it, just do it. How do you tell a story, though? And that's that's what I'm thinking I, of in terms of writing the well, big macro picture. Well, right. Pictures. I mean, somebody conceptualizes it and writes that down in words, right? They say, yeah. picture this guy uh, running up with that, a chair. Have you worked on an ad before? I have not. <laughs> ah. There are, it, we are missing, oh, 20 or 30 binders of documentation at this point. There is a lot of writing at the front end. It's, I, I believe it. I'm. I mean, it's. But again, this is all. This is all creative writing, right? Depends. Actually, uh, your camera instructions is going to be technical writing. Technical writing, and you're going to be giving your art team direction and actually have a lot of editing where they're going to say like this, and you're going to go uh, more blue, and it should feel more like. Uh, hmm, a pair. Right, but this is all after you break the project down and start <laughs> and start treating it as a, a technical project. The beginning creative writing part of it is a creative process, right? I, I could see that it could, uh, it would be a process on either side, really, because when you think about it, it, it I, we weren't really going to go too deeply in the screenplay, but a screenplay for a movie, somebody said it's like 90 pages. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it's only 90 pages. So that's, think of Dune is reduced and everything else is on storyboard and on pictures. And because let's face it, if I'm well, flying two spaceships across the trice shooting at one another, there's not a lot of dialogue. And prop right. notes and continuity notes. And, yeah. and the volume know. of what comes out of it is, is right. absolutely so, enormous. I mean, you, can, but... you can make it analogous to, to writing a novel, right? I mean, people do it differently. Some people just sit down and write straight through. But essentially, what you're talking about, the 90 pages, is a. Um, is an outline, right? So you might start with an outline, but then the storyboards and so forth are the scenes. So, got to disagree with you there. The, the a ninety-page script is probably between, depending on how dense you are, forty-five and ninety minutes, and it's going to include locations, views, and all the words everyone says and any movement that's vital. Move stage left. Say this. Having just seen a play like four hours ago mm -hmm. and having produced plays. I have, a, I have a much different view of this, but I'm going to wrap this back around and I want to ask a question of both my two co-hosts here and you out there in podcast land. What other ways do writers work? We've named a few, you know, but there, there are other ways to make writing. Writing can be your day job that feeds your creative writing as well. And we've talked about professors, we've talked about marketing writers, there's people writing in sales, um, I write curricula, technical writing, what else is there? Let us know what we've missed or if there's something you especially want to know about. Yeah, because there, as I'm saying, in the end of it, it's it always rolls back to, I have an idea, I need to express it to another person. Mm -hmm. Is it creative? Is it, we talk about creative, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Is it I, I look at the glorious work of the oatmeal and the life of the mantis shrimp, which made me in love, fall in love with the mantis shrimp. Ursula <laughs> Vernon putting vampire squid into Danny Dragonbreath books. Oh, and, yeah. And mm. now we all know about vampire squid. Do you know about um, True Facts? It's a, it's a, a video. Zay Frank um, did, a, 
did or still does, I don't know, uh, a, a video series. One of them was a mantis shrimp. You should go look it up on, on YouTube. We'll, we'll look it up and figure it out for you at home. But, you know, the, the guy who was doing the documentary of the honey badger, he took some basic footage and wrote something hilarious with a whole lot of F-bombs. And I suddenly the world was in love with honey badgers where it had never even known that this was a species in Africa that eats snakes and really anything at all because it's just the greatest creature that ever lived. So mm, because, possi possibly my Patronus right. because of the guy that went out there who took some basic nature video and did something mm. funny, similar to the March of the Penguins was a very dignified movie that we all learned about the emperor penguin mm -hmm. and all of that. But then they had Samuel L. Jackson come along and narrate the farce of the penguins, mm -hmm. same movie, same images, Telling an entirely different story, and that's, yeah. So it's it's another way of we looking at all of these things can be writing. You can take something, and I, I view fan, Mar Farce of the Penguins as a kind of fanfic. You know, I view marketing as I, storytelling. How do I want somebody to feel? How do I want somebody to think about something? How do I want to write a compelling idea? There's unfortunately, I think a whole lot of people out there being paid to write bad things and divisive things. And that's, you know, without dipping too deeply, but it's still, I am trying to create a visceral reaction. Horror writing. Mm. I, I love horror. I do. I, <laughs> I, I, I love it in the monster and tentacles. If it's got tentacles and blood and, and horrific things, I, I write horror because I'm angry. And <laughs> yeah. I like horror for various reasons, not, not, because of the horror, um, the um, I remember thinking at one point. This was a long time ago. I remember thinking at one point, "Oh, everything in horror has been done." And then I saw a movie called Tremors. <laughs> you remember that with Kevin Bacon and yep. Fred Ward. Yeah, um, and I was our like, friend Ray worked on that. This is so fresh. I don't know. You know, just I don't know. They just put a whole new spin on it, so it can be done. Yeah, and yeah, when you guys have the horror podcast, I'm going to bow out. <laughs> Well, I have enjoyed writing different short stories in the horrific vein of I deeply loved the pulp fiction of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe was the father kind of of the whole pulp fiction movement and worked on to uh, um, Cthulhu. Who wrote Cthulhu? Why am I oh, trying to blank? H.P. Lovecraft. Forgive me. Yes. And, and he said, use the word horrible so many times in a row because it's everything was horrible, which is where the horror came from. But it's still a visceral way of getting in touch with this was a time where people didn't have roller coasters. I want to be scared. Mm. We used to tell each other ghost stories sitting around the fire. Remember Bloody Bones and Liver? Do you remember mm. the... Bloody the, Bones and Liver? We got eyeballs. Bloody Bones and eyeballs. Oh, well, you know, we children's got, horror got stories. Bloody Bloody Bones. Bones. Regional yeah. differences. Regional differences again. Yeah, but all of these were the kids that sit around a fire telling each other spooky ghost stories. And that's writing. That's all that I think all of the later John Saul came from is something. So you're, in, I think I'm on to her. You're encouraging us to be creative. You're encouraging people to see themselves as writers. Yes. That's your evil plan. It is. Cue the maniacal laughter and the horror. And, and plan it. Remember that it's okay because everything you write at first is going to suck, but it can only get better. And if you're, Find yourself that you're not telling the story you want to tell. It's okay. The next one's going to be better. There is this underlying assumption, though. I'm going to beat on this because... Beat that drum. Because I'm... Pedantic. Hey, your word, not mine. Um, but you're, you're talking about a creative process again. Yeah. Right? So um, not all writing jobs are creative. And some are creative at different levels. So... I would like to leave it there because <laughs> that's I, as close as I can come to agreeing with you right now. We'll, I don't, I don't we'll, know. We'll I, cut out before the thud starts, okay? I, mm -hmm. I once saw an article, journalism, plain, hard-hitting, oh, yeah. factual journalism, where a man in Colorado was telling the story about how mountain lions were eating small little old ladies' dogs. That one I did show you. Yes, you did. And somewhere... That man was howling with laughter and sipping from a whiskey flask mm -hmm. as he was writing this story because it had to be serious and it had to be sober and sympathetic. And yet at the same time, snack food. <laughs> yeah. And the dog's name was Fifi. 
<laughs> and, and I'm sorry for all the fee-fees in the world, but seriously. But yeah, journalism. There you go. We can go deeper into that. We have mm-hmm. uh, a friend I, we can invite back to be a journalistic... Uh, actually, um, tech writing in some ways is very similar to journalism. It is. All of, all of these are paths to writing, and I think you can go out there and find your own path, but we want to encourage you. Uh, we'll try to put links to interesting things we mention on the website, which is www.ridersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can find us on Facebook and a couple of the podcast uh, sources. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, which is a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic was brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween. And our sound engineer, backup web spider, is David Welsh. And guest host. And guest host. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow. And our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear about more from Michael Engberg on Spotify. Today's sponsor was Balls Out Podcasting, except for me. 